I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I too um, would like to um, pay tribute to um, our healthcare workers, um, really everyone across the range of our NHS who right now is doing their utmost to protect us from this appalling virus, uh, to keep us safe and to, um, and to protect the public and to mitigate the effects of what is the biggest public health emergency in any of our lifetimes. Um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support this motion with concerns um, about its content, as others have outlined, but I'm afraid much greater concerns about the consequences of this virus if we had continued as normal or almost as normal. This, this coronavirus bill grants extraordinary powers to government and public bodies, both here and in London. Powers that both curtail the freedom of individuals and reduce the legal obligations that certain bodies have towards citizens. To be clear, in anything close to normal circumstances, this legislation would be unconscionable and unacceptable. As of course, with the speed at which the bill was passed at Westminster and the amount of time we in this assembly have had to consider the enormous implications for our constituents and indeed for our way of life. To take one example, this bill lessens the duty on care providers in relation to adult social care with people, for people with disabilities. The disabled community is understandably concerned. Not only are many disabled people at higher risk from COVID-19 complications, but the societal restrictions we are imposing place in grave danger the support many need to live their lives, which is why hopefully we, need, we will get clearer guidance from social care authorities to reassure them that everything possible is being done to protect disabled people while limiting the spread of this disease. There are many other specific discrete concerns I have and colleagues in this chamber have with this legislation including but not limited to the potential incursion of immigration officials into health care provision and the extremely broad powers of detention which are included in the bill. It is therefore welcome that moves have been made to ensure that the bill is reviewed after six months and we should all hope that it is repealed as speedily as possible notwithstanding uh, our ability to control this virus. I think it's worth saying if this bill does its job it will be off the statute book in Westminster and indeed its provisions that relate to Northern Ireland will be off the statute book as quickly as possible. But we cannot pretend that grave and unpleasant choices do not lie ahead of us. This bill is one of those choices. But clinicians and staff across our NHS will face far more stark and immediate choices in the days and weeks ahead. This bill, unpleasant as it may be, is ultimately about giving them the best possible chance of saving as many lives as possible. But lives will be lost. Northern Ireland is a small place. Very soon it is likely that someone known to a member of this chamber will be directly affected by this virus. Very soon someone from this chamber may be grieving over the loss of a loved one to this virus. And the ability to grieve will, in a sense, be one of the victims of this virus. Funeral rites are particularly important on the island of Ireland, across all denominations, and none. Though I am personally no longer religious, one of the greatest worries I have is not just that our communities are facing death, but facing death without some of the consolations that cushion the force of death. Many people will not be able to be with their loved ones in their final movements, moments, and their ability to hold wakes and funerals may be curtailed. Difficult as it is to face up to, we must be honest with ourselves and honest with the people we represent as leaders in our community. Even in the best case scenario, we are not only talking about significant levels of death, we are curtailing, albeit for the greater good, families and communities' ability to say goodbye according to treasured, sometimes even sacred, customs. When we come through this, and we will, we and all societies will have a period of collective grief to go through, but also, hopefully, relief. Relief that it is over and that we took hard decisions to limit the suffering that this virus caused. Most of us are still today grieving the loss of not just luxuries but basic liberties. The ability to meet a friend for a pint, or to go to the cinema or a football match, or perhaps most painfully of all, the ability to be close to people we love, especially those who are vulnerable and afraid. We are, in a sense, grieving for a loss of civilization, at least temporarily. The poet Michael Longley from South Belfast, writing about our own troubles, wrote of the importance of civilization in the midst of the darkest times. The opposite of war, he wrote, and we are now living through a kind of war, 
was not necessarily peace, but civilization. He wrote, our cobbler mends shoes for everybody. Our butcher blends into his best sausages, leek, garlic, honey. Our corner shop sells everything from bread to kindling. What can bring peace to people who are not civilized? All of these people, alive or dead, are civilized. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are sacrificing some of our civilization today, hopefully in the hope that we will quickly get it back and with as many of our loved ones still with us as possible. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We do indeed live in extraordinary and worrying times. This is a period of